Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to begin reading with verse 1. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdoms against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are, all these are the beginning, the beginning of sorrows. I want to use for a thought today, what shall the sign, what shall be the, uh, the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. What a question. What a question. I want to take you to Jerusalem just a few hours before the crucifixion. Israel has witnessed her Messiah and rejected him. He came into his own. And his own received him not. Jesus is about to die a horrifying death. And no one really understands what's about to take place. Not even uh, the disciples fully comprehend, even though Jesus had told them he would die and be raised the third day. On this last trip, Jesus had come down from Galilee on the east side of the Jordan River and crossed at Jericho where he healed blind Bartimaeus who had cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And Jesus healed him. It is where he called Zacchaeus, saying to Zacchaeus, you come down. Today I, I'm going to dine at thine house. And Zacchaeus would be saved. He would from there enter Jerusalem and weep over the city saying, If thou hast known the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. And he would go on to rebuke the Jews for their religious false ways. And he would cast out even the money changers from the temple and on this memorable day of our morning text, Jesus and his disciples walked down the Kidron Valley up the Mount of Olives. And Mark records this same scene in chapter 13, verse 1. One of his this disciples said these words. He said, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Well, he was, he was speaking of the beauty and the grandeur of that temple. The temple in Jerusalem was considered to be amongst the most uh, spectacular wonders of the ancient Roman world. And, and the original temple constructed by Solomon was a magnificent building that took some seven years to construct and many millions of dollars to build. And then that temple was completely destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in 600 B.C. or thereabouts. When the Jews returned to their homeland 70 years later, after that captivity, they constructed the second temple. And this temple served the Jews for nearly 500 years, but it was, it was nothing compared to the first one. And then by the time of the New Testament, it had suffered damage due to the passage 
of time and was in disrepair. And when King Herod assumed the throne of Israel, he wanted to gain favor with the Jews. And so he offered to rebuild their temple and they accepted it. And in 18 BC, the work began. It was an amazing structure, breathtaking. The beauty of the temple is well documented. The Jewish historian Josephus says that the temple was covered on the outside with gold plates that were so brilliant that when the sun shone on them, it blinded an observer. And then where there was no gold, uh, there were blocks of marble of such a pure white that strangers from a distance thought it was snow on the temple. So whether the temple was seen during the day or the night, it was a sight that one would not forget. And these Jews, they were so proud of their temple and the nobles and the wealthy of Jerusalem. Well, they would build their homes near the temple. They wanted to be close to the temple. And the Jews were known for their beautiful gardens. And it's springtime. And the flowers are blooming. And it's like the temple is set down in the midst of a sea of flowers can only imagine beauty beyond compare. And Jesus will say these words with a sadness in his heart. He says, Matthew 24, verse 2, There shall not be left here one stone upon another and shall, that shall not be thrown down. If you jump ahead some 37 years, Jesus has died. He resurrected. He's ascended back to the Father. And just as he predicted in 70 AD, the Roman general Titus and his army laid siege to the city. One million, 100,000 Jews died in the carnage. Titus had ordered his men to preserve the temple, but the soldiers had heard that there, were, there was gold in between the huge stones, and so they began to dismantle every stone in the building just to get to the gold. And so today, there's not a single stone left from that great temple Herod, Herod had built, just as Jesus said. Came into his own. And his own received him not. They said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. They said, give us Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. And Caesar they got. My friend, Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to save. But when you reject the Son of God, there's nothing left but death and damnation. And that's what happened. The disciples Upon hearing this statement about their beautiful temple, they are in shock. And therefore they ask in verse 3, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? You see, the disciples don't understand. They have no concept of, of a coming destruction of Jerusalem and the advent of the church and the, Israel's dispersion throughout the world. And they probably didn't really understand it until after Pentecost. So they have no clue. The phrase here that is used says the end of the world, and it literally means the end of the age. The Greek word aeon means age or a period of time. So the Bible teaches that this age will end at the Lord's second advent. And there's a lot that can be said there, but let's consider Let's consider our Lord's response to the question about what the signs will be as the end of the age approaches. Listen to verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Mm. Folks, deception is the first great sign of the Lord's coming. You say, well, deception has always been around. Yes, but it will intensify. It will become more and more pronounced, and it will finally culminate with the advent of the man of sin, the Antichrist. Deception is Satan's most powerful weapon. There is absolutely nothing worse than a false way of salvation. And I'll tell you, millions think they are saved. They think they're going to heaven, and they're not. Listen, folks, the Book of Mormon is not the Word of God. Confessing to a priest or counting on a rosary will not gain you forgiveness or favor with God. 
There is no salvation in a Catholic mass. Buddhism is not the way. Islam is certainly not the way. Buddha or Muhammad, they didn't die for your sins. Folks, there aren't five ways or three ways or two ways to God. There's only one way that a man can be saved, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. But hold on, wait, wait a minute here. There are millions of Protestants who think they are saved because they are Baptist or they're Pentecostal or they're Methodist or whatever name, whatever you want to put in there. But I don't care what your label may be, a denomination, non-denomination, or church, whatever it may be. It cannot and will not save your soul. Water baptism, as important as it is, cannot save your soul. Do you hear what I'm saying? Paying tithes, doing good works, being and working in ministry does not save you. You're saved and you're saved alone by the blood of Jesus Christ when he washes away your sins and then only can you be saved. Not one alcoholic, not one drug addict has been delivered by a denomination, a priest, a Buddha, Muhammad, but untold millions have been saved through the mighty name of Jesus Christ. This is why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power or the ability of God unto salvation. It's the only remedy for the ills of humanity. Jesus Christ, he is the only way. So Jesus warns, the potential is certainly there for deception. Not only, understand who he's saying this to. He's saying it to his disciples, his very own, that they needed to beware of deception. For even they could be drawn away by the things they might hear and see. And I want to tell you, folks, the potential still exists. Man fell in the Garden of Eden because of deception. And consequently, deception continues to be man's greatest problem. Let me... Satan can imitate that which is God so closely that it's not so easy to discern. Listen, he doesn't make a $100 bill look like a big coupon. No one would fall for that. That's not how Satan operates. He's a master deceiver. Now, there are some folks that are are good at counterfeiting money, for example, and it takes an expert to know the difference. And in reality, uh, one has to know the real and study the real and and know the genuine and the look and the feel of the money to recognize the difference. And just listen, folks, it's going to take somebody who knows this book and is filled with the spirit to spot error you and i need to be grounded in the word of god we need to be familiar with what the bible says and and what we believe we must ever seek to be near unto the lord we need our our doctrine nailed down tight in our hearts so that when deception comes we can be faithful to stand for the lord why deception will intensify in these last days And it certainly has. Listen, beloved. Error always comes into the church riding on the back of truth. Otherwise, we would reject it out of hand. But Satan makes it palatable. He makes it believable. He appeals to our flesh. This is why, this is why and, and, and the, 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 the name and name it and claim it doctrine has such appeal. You, 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 you mean I can use God's word to get what I want? You mean I, I never have to ever be sick and I can be rich? Yeah, give me some of that. Certainly it has an appeal. Or some of the dominion teaching makes us feel very powerful. You know, we will take over. We'll tell Jesus when he can come back. And this is the very reason why the coming of the Lord is not preached much anymore. We have our roots in this world and don't really want him to come back. The emergent church makes us feel all warm and fuzzy. There's a lot of that going on, folks. Be careful. None of us are so spiritual that we could not fall into Satan's trap just because, hear me, just because they smile a lot. And they have a folksy way about them doesn't make them of God. And when they never point out sin, 
and they never make you feel uncomfortable. And they're, all, uh, they're, uh, they're always saying things you like to hear. Let me just tell you, my friend, you need to run. You need to run just as fast as you can because Satan is laying a trap for your soul. It's poison. Listen, folks, you think it's an aspirin, but it's strychnine. Jesus said, beware of false prophets, wolves who come in sheep's clothing. Somebody said, well, you know, if it walks like a duck, smells like a duck, quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. Oh, no. That's, Jesus said, it may. It may look like a sheep. It may smell like a sheep. It may bawl like a sheep. And it might be a wolf. Be careful. Even what you see, you see sometimes what is purported to be or what may even be in the supernatural realm. Don't you fall for all of that. Do you know that the Antichrist will come and, 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 on the back of religion and power? He has his false prophets, you know. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 says, Paul speaking of the coming Antichrist says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders speaking of the antichrist power signs and lying wonders sounds like he'd be a charismatic kind of guy huh he'd probably be non-denominational just like us seriously he's gonna want everybody to be coming you see he he gonna perform miracles signs and wonders He'll deceive many with his manifestations. Listen, folks, be very, very careful what you run after. I know you think Pastor Harney is boring and Community Harvest Church is boring, but it's the word of Almighty God that's being preached. And you need that word. Somebody else may preach it better. I will grant you that. But it's the word that's being preached. Mm. Bless him, Lord. Jesus, when he was asked by the Pharisees to show them a sign, he said these words, in Matthew 12, 38, Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, listen to this interesting answer. An evil and adulterous generation seeking after a sign. I want to help you here. You might get angry with me, but I want to help you. Jesus said that sign seekers, I said sign seekers, are evil and adulterous. What did he mean? He's referring to spiritual adultery. Simply put, for one to desire signs, manifestations, miracles more than Jesus is to be guilty of spiritual adultery. When your relationship with Jesus does not satisfy to the point where you, you have to run to and fro looking for signs and manifestations, you're being unfaithful to the Lord. Folks, there are real and there are genuine manifestations of God that I accept, I want, I desire, and they are a blessing. But I don't need them to satisfy my heart. Do you hear that? I found my Savior, my Redeemer, to be quite adequate. He is the bread of life for my hungry soul. He is water of life for my thirst. He's my counselor, my guide, my strength. He is my friend who sticks closer than a brother. He talks to me in his word, and it's enough. He hears me when I cry out to him in prayer, and it is enough. His peace, his joy, and his presence is all I need. And I'm not looking for anything else. I'm not looking for anything better. There is nothing better. I have found what I've been looking for all my life. And while I'm thankful for genuine signs, I'm not seeking them. I don't have to. Jesus said they will follow me. You see, we get it backwards. There's a whole lot of fickle Christians who are looking for more and more. And they are prime candidates for deception. Amen. Seeking after this thing and that thing. You need to seek after this thing. Amen. And let those things follow. Mm. 
Well, Jesus went on to say in verse 5, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. This is a sign of his coming. I am Christ. We know people do that. We know people just recently, some, some Yehu did that. But he actually, actually, when it says, I am Christ, actually means that they will carry on the work in the name of Jesus, claiming to be anointed, which is what the name Christ or Christos means. They're, in other words, saying, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. Luke says something very interesting in his account. In verse 20, chapter 21, verse 80, he said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name. In my name, say, I am Christ. And he says, And the time draws near. Go ye not therefore after them. In other words, the closer we get to his return, the more the deception. Go not after them, he says. Don't run after them. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. It's interesting to note that when Jesus was born, peace reigned on the entirety of the earth. The angels proclaimed peace when he was born. And for 33 years there was peace. However, upon the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension of Christ, the Roman Empire was almost immediately turned into military disturbance. From then until now, there has been wars and rumors of wars. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember President Bush, the dad, upon the breakup of the former Soviet Union, he declared that we had come to a new world order. You remember that? It was to be a world without war or serious threat. However, almost immediately the Middle East erupted and has continued along with many other conflicts. Wars ravage our planet, even as man claims to be climbing higher and higher on the ladder of intelligence and compassion and peace. And war, my friend, will continue until the Prince of Peace Amen. comes back. Jesus said, though, when you see all that, be not troubled. He's directing that to us, the believer. Because when you look at what's going on, it could be very troubling. He said, don't be troubled. These things must come to pass. He says, men will wax worse and worse. Contrary to some doctrines out there, they're going to, they're going to get worse and worse. But God is in control. He will use the terrible tragedy of war to shape the world for the coming of his son. God uses the wrath of men for his own glory. Do not be dismayed by warfare. It is merely God moving his pieces into place for the end game. So be not troubled. Our anchor is Christ. Here's what Luke said in chapter 21, verse 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads. For your redemption draweth nigh. You hear me? Don't be troubled. It just means Jesus is about to come back. Verse 7, verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be a constant upheaval in the world. Jesus tells us as long as the world stands, there's going to be strife among the nations. And there shall be famines. There will be famines every 3.6 seconds. Someone dies of starvation. Every year, 15 million children die of starvation or hunger-related illness. Four million people starve to death every year. 1.3 billion people live on less than $1 of income per day. Another 3 billion have, uh, survive on less than $3 per day. Famines devastate the poor nations of this world. All you have to do is go and see. And listen, folks, we're just one bad harvest away from starvation here in America. Famines will increase as the end nears. And he says there will be pestilences. 
meaning that there will be an upsurge in disease and plagues as the end times approach. And folks, we're fully aware of this right now, of this immediate danger we're all in, in this uh, Ebola a virus that's reached the shores of America. And of course, our wonderful leaders won't cut off flights from the countries where they're coming from because, you know, it might hurt them economically. Why don't they just give the billions they're already given to them? And protect this nation Amen. and the citizens of the United States like they are commanded and told to do by our Constitution. Amen. But forget that. We must not allow this thing to fill our hearts with fear. It is fearful. It's in Ohio now. But Jesus, he's got a good grip. Jesus said we would see diseases and pestilences and trouble of every kind increase as the end approached. It should not shock us. It should let us know Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. It's a good reminder. Jesus is coming. We don't want it. We, 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 don't, want to, we don't want to be, but he, we know Jesus is coming. Finally, he says there will be earthquakes in diverse places, and certainly the world is no stranger to earthquakes. And scientists tell us that more than 13 million people have died in earthquakes, and that statistic is from some time back over the past 4,000 years. We've seen tens of thousands die in our lifetime. Wasn't that long ago was the earthquake uh, tsunami in Japan killed, I think, maybe over 20,000 people. I mean, it's, it's, we see it. Earthquakes are increasing in their frequency and their intensity, and they will continue to do so as the end of time approaches. Now, let me go to verse 8. Let's wrap this up. Verse 8. Jesus says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. It's a sobering promise. Jesus tells his disciples that really we can't know when the end will come, the exact date, but when we see these things, we know that it's the beginning of sorrows. The phrase means the beginning of birth pangs. Really, it's what the word means. It's, it, it's the meaning of that word. Ne nearly every woman here who has given birth would tell you that when those first contractions strike that they are just an indicator of a long hard time ahead and the patterns we're seeing are just like labor pains and contractions they start they stop they come again even with more intensity and they continue to increase that's what's happening in our world as the Lord's coming is near. Jesus wants us to know it. He wants us to know that he's coming. That was his promise while he was here. He said in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again. And receive into myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's what he said. The angels said it when Jesus ascended back to heaven. The angels said, the same Jesus that you see go away. He's coming back again. Just as you see him go. Well, Paul said it like this. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain will be caught up into the clouds to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. He's coming back. He's coming back. <coughs> Jesus will go on to describe the way things will be in what we call the Great Tribulation. The time of the Bible describes Jacob's trouble. Jesus would go on to say it would be, it will be a time such as the world has never known. It's getting closer now than ever before. In Luke's account, 
Jesus says some interesting words that I want to read to you as we look to close today. Jesus said, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged or we could say weighed down with surfeiting self-indulgence. Take heed. Take heed that you don't get weighed down with self-indulgence and drunkenness and the cares of this life even. They can weigh you down. So that what? That day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Then he says this to us, to us, verse 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape, worthy to escape, to escape what? All these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man, the great escape. That's what I'm looking for. The great escape. I'm looking for Jesus to rapture his church. You say it's a fairy tale. Oh, no. It's going to happen. You can be sure. Jesus is coming. Well, I think it's mid-trib or post-trib or pre Whatever you think, he's coming. And he's going to take us out. In my view of the Bible, before he pours out his wrath upon this world. For he has not called us unto wrath, but that we might obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. But he says, watch. Pray. No, you know what's going to happen. You see the things I say. He says, watch. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready to face death? Have you been saved by the grace of God? If you have not, I implore you to bend your knee to Jesus. Repent of your sins. Believe the gospel. For the Lord will save you if you'll come to Him. But if not, even though he came to save, he didn't come to condemn. But if you reject him, you'll face his wrath. Such as the Bible describes in the book of Revelation that there will be those who will cry for the mountains, the rocks to fall upon them. And if you sense the Lord drawing you, Speaking to you today, heed his call. Come to Jesus right now. He will not turn you away. For they that come to him, he will no wise, no way will he cast them out. But you must make that choice. 